Hello, Phil Croshaw here from Passions, and in this episode, we're going playing rugby. Hello and a very warm welcome to this episode of Passions and I'm absolutely delighted today to be joined by what some might say is a rugby legend and that's the gentleman that is Terry Burwell. So a very warm welcome to Passions Terry. Great to be with you Phil and looking forward to the next hour or so. Fantastic. Okay, well, let's start with the obvious question, seeing as the, the, the channel that we're on is called Passions. Um, without, without making assumptions, what would you say your passion is? Well, undoubtedly, the thread that's run through most of my sort of childhood and, and, and adult life has, has been rugby football. And um, whilst my family are very, very, very dear to me in lots of different respects, um, they have um, have worked alongside me in, in that in that journey right from not from the very earliest stages obviously when I first uh, learned the game but certainly in my relationship with my wife and and, and the engagement of my children in, in the game um, you know there's there's no doubt that um, you know rugby football look around the house look at the, at the things that are in the house and you know it, it, it's formed you know a huge part of my life and and, and delivered for me you know a, a huge amount of enjoyment along the way. So how did how did it all start? Were you um, were you were you born uh, in the hospital room with a rugby football in your hand, or how how did the journey begin? Well, no, I, I was a, a, a policeman's son in a small village uh, about seven miles north in Northampton, and what changed my my direction is up past the eleven plus, um, and it was at the times passing the eleven plus sent you to the grammar school, which was fantastic. Um, I, I was the only boy from the village that year that went, so all my mates went across to to Gillsborough um, Secondary Modern to play football, which was a football school. And I set off to, to Northampton Grammar School to play, to be introduced to the game of rugby football. And of course, in that environment, initially, we had two legends of their time, a ring and wings, one called Frank Sykes, who British Lion and Northampton winger, another one called Martin Underwood. And, and both of those were really formative in my early stages of, of, of developing, you know, a passion for rugby football. Uh, and, and inevitably, I think anybody that talks about passions will will track them back to those sort of early first touches, those those first opportunities that they came across. And there's no doubt that being exposed to, you know, legends at that particular time and people with a huge passion for the sport themselves sort of set not just myself, but a whole generation of young young people, because I keep touch with some of those now who are going forward to, you know, to, to stay engaged and be engaged in the sport for what we call lifelong participation. You know, it's, it, it's a sport that, that stays with you. Um, uh, you mentioned journey in your early introduction, and I very much believe that, that it is a rugby journey and, and you, you, you stay the course, really, is, is a simple term. Okay, so um, one thing that always interests me and fascinates me, actually, is how probably at school, uh, well, throughout your whole life, really, but you come to a crossroads and circumstances are such that you go one way or another way. So was there a possibility that in a parallel universe, you'd have gone a different direction and down the, down, down the route of a different sport, like I suppose football is the most obvious one? Well, interesting enough, yes, my parents moved to Bournemouth in, 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 uh, when, at the beginning of, the, of what was the fourth form. So I, I was leaving my, my rugby environment in, in, in the East Midlands in Northampton and going to Bournemouth School, which was essentially a football school. And, and whilst, you know, I continued to play football and enjoyed playing football with my friends and, you know, in the village life that we had, you know, this was, this was a culture change. But Bournemouth School, like, interestingly, was just starting to, to have a meaningful rugby programme uh, under, uh, under another really good land, landmark teacher, chap called Michael Webb. And, and you know, between us, it, uh, it suddenly 
this lad that could play a bit, that had come from a rugby school, was dropped into a football environment. And the interesting thing at that point is that we played football in the mornings at school and rugby in the afternoon. So I had to play both. If I wanted to play rugby, I had to play both. And I, I totally enjoyed football. And in fact, you know, I, I was a half decent goalkeeper to the point that, you know, I was that we saw some interest with, with former football club and stuff. But I was playing fullback at the time. So you know, my position was always sort of, you know, defending the back third, if you like. Um, um, and it's a consequence of that, but nevertheless, I, I think perhaps because I was taking a, a, a leadership position, something even at that early stage in Bournemouth schools rugby development, you know, it, it, it took me down that particular path, and ultimately, that was why I applied to go to Loughborough College, and um, you know, which was you know essentially the breeding ground of so many great international players and, and, and international coaches as well. So um, you know. It, Yes, there was a distraction there, but um, I think I probably, you know, just, just recognised where my particular, you know, direction would go. Um, and, and I continue to enjoy playing football with my friends and every other sport that was available to us. I mean, the advantages of a child at that time is you didn't specialise. You know, you became very, very rounded, you know, young athletes across a range of sports. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've got my um, my old school... A magazine, the Bourne Albion from that time, and, and reading what I allegedly did or didn't do at that particular time, you know, remains a great joy to, to look back on, on what you did as a 16 year old, a 17 year old, and, and how your peers saw you at that time, which is really quite interesting. So, so incidentally, do you still follow football or soccer for our American uh, viewers? It, yeah, I do actually. I mean, because actually, you know, what, I was thought in, in those early 60s, you'll remember Northampton Town were, were, were the, were, or the Cobblers, as we like to call them, went from the old fourth division to the first division. And, and you know, the old three sided ground, which we shared with the cricket club at, uh, at Northampton, you know, you used to get somehow you used to shoe on about 27,000 people into there. So I, I watched the Cobblers play and, and, and have remained at, you know, in, in, you still look for particular results, don't you? So I, I look for I look for the Cobbs results. But when I moved to Bournemouth, um, we um, we became terrorist uh, lads on the Saturday afternoon if we weren't playing and went to watch them. And I, you know, I, I was great. I watched the Bournemouth side at that time with Ted McDougall and Phil Boyer and some of some of some of that great. Ted went on to play for um, uh, for Man United, as you probably were, and and you know saw the game when he scored nine goals against Zero of Margate in the FA Cup. So. Yes, you, you know, as you can see, I mean, sport, it, yes, I'm, of course, you know, you cut me in half and I've got a rugby ball in there somewhere. But, you know, um, I, st I still look very closely at, at, at what, well, what was Bournemouth and Boscombe Athletic, who we refer to as Boscombe, and now goes under the grand title of AFC Bournemouth. But, um, you, know, um, you know, they were the cherries for me and, 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 and the cobblers besides. So, I, you know, I've never, ever supported anything other than, than the lower reaches of football um, and enjoyed every month. I did for a period of time. We lived in Rushton for a while in, 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 in Northamptonshire in a village called Earthlingborough. And there's a football team there called Earthlingborough Diamonds. And they merged to become Rushton and Diamonds. And um, a chap called Max Griggs um, uh, developed that. So, uh, you know, I... I've always had a bit of a fashion, uh, you know, a fascination for, for sport at that level. And, and, you know, whilst I can watch football, um, you know, rugby, rugby engages me significantly more. So for those that don't know, then talk me through the career then, Terry. You obviously went to Loughborough. Where did you go from there? And, and what's the story? What happened? Well, Loughborough is, is, is the building block, really. And, and those of us that, that went to Loughborough, I mean, talk about Loughborough being for life and the opportunities that brought about. I mean, you know, I, I was fortunate and privileged that, that there was a, a coach there called Jim Greenwood, who, who was one of the great forward thinking coaches of, in rugby football, 1955 British Lion, you know, a really dry Scot. And I, put, I was in a team which had, had what ultimately became a number of rugby legends. So the Frank Cottons of this world and Steve Smith's, you know, the Clyde Reeses, all of them British Lions, the Lewis Dick from Scotland, you know, um, Morris Trapp, who went on to become president of the, of the New Zealand Rugby Union and, and was a premier coach of Auckland. You know, that was the formative teams that I played in. So I, I played along some, some fantastic, great players with, with a yet another influential coach. So took, you know, look at the journey, go back at Frank Sykes, look at Jim Greenwood and Dummy House. They started to develop your philosophy and your love for the sport. Uh, and having left um, um, Loughborough, you know, after three great year, years and, and, and really needed to, to repay my, my mother's favour. You know, we go back to a time when 
you know, your parents made great sacrifices to put you through university or college as, as it was. And of course, you know, I, I was teacher trained by this stage. Um, interestingly enough, when I went to Loughborough, I wasn't sure I was going to teach a training college. I thought I was going to go and play rugby for three years. Um, <laughs> uh, it came as a nasty surprise in, the, in halfway through the first year when they sent us out on teaching practice. Um, uh, uh, but, but nevertheless, you know, that was, uh, you know, we, we survived, I think is probably the best way of describing it. Anyway, ironically then, my first teaching job, would you believe, was at Northampton Grammar School. Um, so um, six year, five, six years after leaving there as a, as a fourth form, I ended up back there as, as master in charge of rugby um, at, uh, at Northampton Grammar School. So I'd, I'd gone pretty much full circle and I was back in an environment which I was very familiar with. Uh, and there, um, you know, I spent a huge amount of time working and coaching rugby football, which, uh, which was great, but also joined the Northampton Club. Now, Northampton was my my boyhood club um we used to go we used to go down to um uh, to franklin's gardens after our matches at, uh, at, at the grammar school and, and, and watch the saints play and in, in those days we could buy a school schoolboy season ticket uh in there it cost us a shilling um, um some people might not remember what a shilling, shilling is but <laughs> it, 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 not a lot of money uh, and we could go and watch 20 odd games a season in, in, in the afternoon at, at, at franklin's gardens so therefore you know we'd play in the morning watch in the afternoon uh, and so now i was actually joining that club where i'd, I'd been a schoolboy at that time and to be honest with you it was a very successful club um and i'd come out as a you know, it's a different generation of uh, of young fullback um, at the time, and to, and quite honestly, um, you know, probably didn't make the steps that I thought I should. Um, and and as a consequence, actually, interestingly enough, I played in a game for East Midlands, which was the county side at Middlesex um, uh, at Roslyn Park, and uh, playing alongside me was with Brian Hall, who was a very very good member of of, of Leicester Tigers. And he lived in Northampton. He said, well, you're obviously not getting the rugby you'd like, uh, Terry. Why don't you consider coming to Leicester? So in 1974, I, I, I took the route up the A50 um, uh, and, and joined the Tigers. And, uh, and you know, the, that was obviously, you know, the, a fantastic move. I, I, I still retain my roots in Northampton very strongly. Of course I do. But, um, you know, I don't regret that move for a moment because I then came... And, uh, you know, the, the next most influential, or probably the most influential, H3 Chalky White, who, who at the time was acknowledged as a world-leading coach, you know, thought things through very carefully and, and very pragmatically, but was a great people person as well. And um, from that process, you know, I, I, I got into the Leicester side, played, you know, well over 100 times for the, for the Leicester first team, played in a couple of cup finals um, at a time when Leicester were the preeminent club and have been the preeminent club, um, although struggling at the present time. Um, and so that was that was a huge part of my life. And of course, in that in that team, once again, I was fortunate enough to play with the greats of the game: the Peter Wheelers, the Les Puzzles, the Dusty Hares, the Clive Woodwards, the Paul Dodge, uh, who went to being a captain. You know, right through there, the Gary Aders, the you know, the, the names just just ring off. Um, but of course, alongside a lot, there were a lot of all you know really good quality, you know. Um, you know, club men that, that worked in, in, in that, the Angus Covingtons of this world, you know, the Jess Critches and so on and so forth, you know, that have, that have become, you know, part of your lifelong lexicon of, of, of contacts, really. Um, so Leicester was, was, was a huge part of that life, by which time um, I left teaching in, in, in 79. I taught for seven years and, you know, I still see that as, as, as if you like, my vocation. Um, but I, I ultimately didn't see it as my career. And a, a number of my peers... Uh, were being recruited into the finance world, specifically into building societies. And at the time, uh, John Carlton, for one, who played on the wing for England, uh, Jeff Squire, who played, played back row for, for, for Wales, uh, and one infamous character called Colin Smart from Newport, who played for England, who was a legendary after shave drinker in the England France game all those years ago, which, which some rugby people remember. Uh, where he managed to drink after shave instead of the usual um, champagne, but uh, that's, a, that's a different story, perhaps for another day. Some people will, will, will be reminded of it. But but from that point, that, that group of, of people, we we actually went off to join what's known as the Gateway Building Society, uh, uh, which ultimately merged to become the Woolwich, and I, I ended up in a, in a position for the next decade or so as the. Um, uh, regional manager in the East Midlands around Northampton, branch manager in Northampton. So I was back in Northampton again, 
Uh, and I came back to Northampton um, at that time, rejoined them as a player and ended up playing for Northampton, um, you know, all that sort of decade up onwards. Um, uh, soon after that, I decided to, you know, to step back and, and coach at a local junior club called Northampton Trinity, which um, uh, played on a local park at Dallington. So I'd gone right back to, uh, to Roots and I, I became sort of player coach from that. We were quite, pretty successful with a group of, of, of great young people. And, and from there, I ended up coaching Northampton. So I've now gone full circle. I'm now coach at the club that, that, that I'd left, that I'd watched as a player, that I'd been involved and, and you know, had um, two, uh, two fantastic years there uh, at the beginnings of league rugby in, in the late 80s we are now. Um, but then I, in, in another direction uh, changed. Um, the game was heading towards the open era, um, but it was going to be another five years before the 95 and, and the declaration of the open game. Uh, but in 1990, Newbury Rugby Club down there in Berkshire decided that they uh, needed somebody to help them move from their existing ground um, at the top of the bypass in Newbury a little way along uh, along the, the A34. And uh, I was headhunted, really. I, I would describe as somebody that, that could look at, at both that job and also the coaching and other jobs. So, 1990, I became the, one of the first um, professional directors of rugby, directors of coaching, whichever term you want to use. So um, groundbreaking at the time, particularly in, 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 a, in a small level seven club as it was. But, um, you know, the ambition was there. And of course, the finance was there because we were about to sell the ground for, well, just before the financial crash at that time, the ground was worth about 13 million, came down to three and a half million, but was still significant enough to buy a new super facility you know within the um the boundaries of the town so i i i, I engaged that um took the team uh, developed the, the the game developed you know the whole structure of the uh, of the club um and come 1986 87 my um uh just, i wouldn't say my job was done but newbury are now at level three we've, we've gone up four levels in that time we've moved to this new three and a half million pound fantastic facility we run leicester very close in the in what was the pilkington cup at that time losing 26 21 at leicester um in a season where we only lost two games to leicester and uh, and to western samoa who came to open our ground at um at, at monks lane at that time uh, and we won all other 26 matches that we played so so that was a you know, it was a, you know a time to, to get out but the RFU was in desperate needs of, 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 of a new professionalisation of its staff. And I went to Twickenham as, uh, as um, what was then director of Twickenham Services, which was managing the operational side of the sport um, at, at all levels. So involved in, in both the early professional structure, but also in developing the, you know, the other work around the game. So that's sort of a whistle stop through um, <laughs> to the 80s oh. and 90s, um, you know, uh, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm now uh, uh, in, in 1997. And, and, and this is really interesting because the last game we played, uh, uh, I played at Newbury August the 30th, 1997. So it's local derby at Reading. We, we beat Reading um, and we all went out for, for, for a curry that night to say, you know, thank you very much and nothing else. And because I was due to start work on, on the Monday at, at, at Twickenham, 1st of September. And uh, um, we woke up the next morning on the 31st of August to the news that Princess Diana had been killed in a car crash overnight in Paris. Um, so I go into work on the Monday morning uh, and um, one of my responsibilities was the RFU competitions. And uh, the first decision I had to, I had to make or, or did make was to cancel all rugby the following weekend because it was going to clash with Diana's funeral. Um, oh, and, of course, yes, that's right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, Baptism uh, of fire, you might say. Yeah, so I was in by lunchtime. <laughs> yeah. I was on there to help develop and grow the game. I've ended up telling everybody they can't play. Um, <laughs> you know, so there was but yeah. of course, there yeah. all of the right reasons, and we we were we were um, uh, lordly praised for making a very quick and, and correct decision. Football. Um, you know, then made the same decision later on the day, but we we were really keen to to ensure that that we match the the nation's mood really at that particular time. So that was a baptism and fire, and then mm. and then you know I I, I was with the rugby football union for the next eleven twelve no fourteen years in total. So I left in twenty eleven, um, 
And that, you know, the, the, the time there was, was, was hugely satisfying, not least the 2003 World Cup, the top end, but I was also director of community rugby by that time and, and, and also had an operational role. So, uh, you know, I had a, a hand in, in a whole range of, of initiatives and developments to support the game from the Sweet Chariot Tour following the 2003 World Cup to working with World Rugby on the World 7 Series to being engaged with... Uh, with all of our local competition structure, introducing new coaching infrastructure, etc., and then finally, my last job was to, was to put the tender bid together for the 2015 World Cup on behalf of the RFU, which we were successful in in in, in getting um, in July 2009, uh, and then you know that became. And I left the RFU um, uh, in 2011 in, into into retirement. I was offered you know, an opportunity at that time, which I took, um, and uh, you know that. I then started a, a different facet of, of, of my rugby journey because now I, I've gone from being, you know, if you like, a career professional in the sport uh, over, you know, a fairly extensive period of time. And I looked to say, well, where where am I going to continue to get my rugby fix? And I, and I started refereeing again. I'd refereed infrequently, um, um, particularly on Sunday mornings at Newbury. I'd still gone back in, and done that and so on. Uh, so I started refereeing and thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, uh, got engaged again, played regularly, you know, Wednesday afternoons, sometimes Saturdays, etc. And then um, I, uh, I was actually a member of Berkshire Society and Hampshire Society, and um, Hampshire asked me if I'd, um, I'd like to do a role of, uh, of what's known as appointment secretary, which I did. And, and as a result of that, you know, I'm back in the administrative fold, and, and, but now as a volunteer. Um, and, you know, there's absolutely no difference between volunteers and professionals. They spend exactly the same amount of time on things. It's just, just only one lot get paid and the other lot doesn't. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, yeah. you know, I'm fortunate, yeah. you know, I'm drawing an RFU pension. So to some extent, I'm subsidized along the way. Yeah. Uh, but um, yes, from there, I got, I got back into in, into FREM, by which time we, we, we were living in Newbury. We've moved down to where we are now on the coast from the, between Christchurch and Limington uh, Barton on the Sea. I'm, I'm now chairman of, of uh, by this time, I'm chairman of the local referee society, um, uh, working to lead lead our match officials in in the county, and and not refereeing so regularly now because I've had a I've had a series of um, of mishaps, a knee replacement from from other sides. I've had a hip replacement having come off my bike, um, and uh, so as a consequence, I'm now a referee advisor. So I watch referees at weekend. I help them develop. You know, I, I give them, you know, some intuition on, on things they could and shouldn't do. Um, but then a couple of years ago, um, the constituent body, Hampshire, um, needed to appoint a council, an RFU council member to represent Hampshire. Now, the RFU council is, is what you know, many people remember as, as Will Carling's 57, etc. I now rejoined the RFU council, um, uh, and which is a decision-making policy board at, at the RFU. Uh, and I represent the clubs in membership there. So my, my time now is is is, is taken with, with looking after the, the interests of the, the 34 clubs that we, we have in membership here in Hampshire, especially in this, this particularly challenging year. Uh, but also I have a number of functional roles at the RFU. Notably, I'm, I'm chair of both the Adult Competitions Management Committee uh, and I'm also chair of, of, of the group that's advising on, on how we manage our competitions through, through COVID. Um, and all of that has kept me pretty busy um, through, uh, <laughs> through Fantastic. lockdowns and quarantines and goodness knows what else. But I mean, and, and you know, <laughs> it's an interesting thing. Because back 2003, um, um, we did a piece of work with Zurich at the time. We were the major sponsors of the Premiership. Uh, uh, and they came together. We, we, we did a piece of work where we look at, at the direction of rugby. And we, we put something together called the Rugby Journey. And it was, it was essentially where I started on this process where I was saying, look, people get on to the rugby and look for the lifelong participation. And of course, it, you know, here is, you know, my, my rugby journey couldn't be a better illustration of just, just what they're talking about. But it's, but it's not unique, uh, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. It, it might be unique in its profile and in the positions that I've held and the positions I've been, but there are thousands of people along the way who have done just that without any of the profile that I've had. They've just worked, you know, for dozens of years for the benefit of their clubs and their membership and their local community. Um, and to some extent, whilst I, you know, I might have, as I say, this sort of titled in, uh, uh, there and I may have enjoyed some of the, the privileges that go with that, you know, I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that, you know, there are literally thousands of people 
that share my passion and share my, my enjoyment, but just do it because it's their, it's part of their community feel. Uh, and that's yeah. really, I think that's a really important point to make. It is.